worship team. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all. Welcome to New Life Be Free. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. In a moment, uh, Josh Toll, one of our elders, will come and, and lead us in the reading of scripture and in prayer. Uh, but for now, let me just pause and mention a couple of announcements. You'll find uh, some key announcements in your bulletin, so make sure you read through those, but I will just highlight a couple right now. Uh, first of all, don't forget we have new church mailboxes. Uh, would you just get in the habit of checking those each Sunday? They're located right outside of these double doors. And then if you would look at the very bottom, I want to spend some time highlighting the Messiah in the Passover uh, ministry event. Would you uh, mark down and just kind of keep in mind Wednesday, March 17th, which is just a few weeks away, uh, Grace E. Free in Marshalltown is hosting this event on that evening uh, that we're just simply calling Messiah in the Passover. If you read that announcement, you'll see that uh, a, a person, a, a representative from Chosen People's Ministries, which is a Jewish messianic ministry, uh, is going to be there that night. And, and if you've ever been, some of you have participated in this before, so you know, you will know what I'm talking about, but he will come in and, and lead us through a traditional Jewish Passover meal. Now, of course, this is timely because we're entering the uh, Easter season, the Passover season, but of course, he will note through that presentation the connections with Jesus Christ, and especially with the Last Supper and how Jesus was using that meal to point to himself and to the gospel. So, uh, I, how many have been a part of this? I know some uh, in our body have seen this before. I have as well. It's been a while. Uh, if you have not, I would really encourage you to, to try to get to that. It is encouraging. You will see communion in a, in a different light and how Jesus uh, conducted that last supper meal. So uh, right down the, the 17th of March, uh, there we will not have youth that, that night, which is junior high and high school, and uh, no prayer meeting as well. So we're kind of clearing the, the calendar so that you could get to that if you would choose. I'm looking forward to being there myself. So. Uh, Josh, would you come forward now and, and lead us in a time of scripture and prayer, please? Thank you, brother. Good morning, everybody. This morning I'll be reading from Psalm 118, starting with verse 14. And if you're if you're turning to that, I'm going to give just a few few seconds to do that. Um, just wanted to mention that, um, as Steve said last week, we are starting a new video series in during Sunday school hour, so the hour just preceding the service here, and it's entitled "Is the Bible Reliable?" So we're going to be going through that video series for the next few months. So uh, 
you know, if you if you don't regularly attend, uh, been thinking about it, you know, please please do come. Um, you can jump right in week two, next week. So here we go. Verse fourteen of Psalm one eighteen. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the, in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastised me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come here this morning to rejoice and be glad. Lord God, we rejoice, Lord, in the salvation that uh, you've made available to everybody. And Lord God, as, the, as, the, uh, as I ponder the, the words of the song that we sang to, to lead off the service, Lord. Um, Lord, you knew the sins that we were going to create or create. You knew the sins that we were going to commit before we were created. Lord, and you still sent your son down the cross for our sins. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Uh, it is beyond comprehension, Lord God. And Lord God, so we, we come before you just to praise you, honor you, Lord God. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would bless the offerings, Lord, that, we, that have been given and will be given. Lord, help us to use those those funds, Lord God, to be a light, to be salt and light, Lord God, in our community around us and globally. Lord, I pray that uh, as we prepare for the service here, I pray that you would just quiet our hearts. I pray, Lord God, that you remove distractions, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit may just speak to us through your word, um, your holy word, Lord. And Lord, as we've talked about in the Sunday school, Lord God, your, your word is it's yours. It's from you, Lord God. Um, it's full of authority, and it is our manual, Lord God. We thank you for it. And as we prepare to study it here in the service, I pray, Lord God, that you would help us again just to focus on what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us again as we continue in our worship service? We'll sing, O Fount of Love.
Ihnen singen. Join me in Jonah chapter 2, please. The book of Jonah chapter 2. We continue Global Missions Month here at New Life in the month of February. Global Missions is a very important part of our church's identity and vision, and we are thankful to be able to participate in the taking of the good news of Jesus Christ to all peoples and all nations. And during this month, with this special focus, we are studying this fascinating book in God's Word called Jonah. We're going to end up taking uh, Global Missions Month a couple of weeks into March as we need a few more Sundays to wrap up this book. Last week in our study of the book, we left the prophet Jonah splashing down into the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. We ended on kind of a cliffhanger. You recall that Jonah had rebelled against the command of God to go to preach to the people of Nineveh in the dreaded Assyrian Empire. He'd gotten on a ship to run away from that assignment, and after the storm that God had sent, Jonah ends up being thrown into the ocean. It seemed that to both Jonah and the sailors on the boat, this was the only answer as to how they could appease God. Jonah is clearly assumed dead by all, including us as the reader, if you're reading through this for the first time. And that is where we left him after la uh, last Sunday, just hitting the cold, dark ocean water. This morning, we pick up the account in chapter 2. Actually, we have one last verse we need to cover in chapter 1. We come back to Jonah, and we will see what happens to him after he hits the water. I don't want to spoil anything at this point, so I will just leave it at that for now. We'll see what happens to him. Does he indeed die? We'll see about that. And then we'll close this morning by summarizing our study with three observations from the text. Would you join me in prayer before we go any further? Lord, we thank you for um, Global Missions Month here at New Life. We thank you for the ability we have to participate in this, the taking of of the good news of Jesus to all peoples and all nations. Father, as we uh, sort of conclude our um, prayer for the global missions uh, ministries and, and missionaries we support as we finish that today, we lift up uh, Philip and Missy. We thank you for them and their family, their children, and the ability we have to support them as our newest supported missionaries. And Lord, we just, um, I, I just want to, as we consider them right now in prayer, I just want to praise you for the answered prayer um, of allowing them to go back to their mission field. Um, they asked for that when they were with us, and you have opened that door uh, in just a matter of a few weeks here, and we give you our praise for that. Prepare them, um, help them, especially the children, as they uh, prepare to go back, and we just offer you our praise. We also thank you for Operation Christmas Child, Lord, and the ability we've had to participate in that over the years. Thank you for the team that you've raised up here at New Life to oversee that ministry. We ask that you would encourage them and fill them with uh, wisdom and discernment as they look ahead to a new year and the packing party, Lord willing, this fall. Thank you for them and, and all the, the effort they put into that and how we as a church body uh, just benefit from all of their work. And Lord, we just continue to ask for those shoe boxes that went out this last um, fall, Christmas time, that you would continue to work powerfully through the gospel that was communicated in those shoe boxes. I thank you, Lord, just what a, what a joy it is to participate in that each year. Thank you for each one that contributes here in our church body with uh, materials for the boxes. I know that's a year-round process that they are thinking about that, and uh, we offer you our thanks and our praise. 
We ask your blessing now on our study of Jonah chapter 2. May this be for your glory, for the edification of your church, and for your name's sake both here and indeed across the globe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take a look at chapter 1. We are still in chapter 1, verse 17. We need to finish chapter 1 first. Let's do that by looking at the great fish, the great fish. Take a look at 117. Jonah has hit the water, and it says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three days. I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but it's worth repeating. We cannot forget where we left Jonah last Sunday. He is as good as what? Dead, hitting the water of the ocean. But now we are told he is swallowed by this fish. Of course, don't miss the fact that this animal is sent by God. The word appointed there is the Hebrew word meaning assign or prepare or ordain. It's not the only time we're going to see that word in this book. God is also going to appoint or assign another animal in this book, but also plant life and weather. So don't miss this, folks. This is yet another example of the sovereign, all-powerful hand of God at work. We saw it last week. We see it again this week. All animal life, including this fish, belongs to our God. They are his to do with as he pleases. And so the Lord appoints this animal to go and snatch up Jonah from the water. This animal acts at the will of our powerful God. Jonah is swallowed by this fish, but he does not die. Through this fish, God is graciously, compassionately, mercifully preserving Jonah's life. He's saving his life. Now, before we go any further, what's up with this fish? What's going on here? Is there any way to know what kind of fish we're talking about? (laughs) Well, we're given just a few details in this verse. First of all, we are told that it is a great fish, aren't we? By the way, that's our same word, folks, that we saw multiple times last week. Gadol in the Hebrew, meaning great, exceeding, or important. Very key word in this book. This was a gadol fish, a great fish that the Lord used. Secondly, we are specifically told that Jonah spends his time in this fish in the belly of the fish. So we're obviously given some kind of marker in terms of its size. In terms of the big picture of all of this, realize that one of two things is probably happening here. God has either created, listen, created a unique great fish specifically appointed for this task. In other words, a type of fish unknown to us, and he can do that, can he not? Or, He is using a type of fish that would be familiar to us to accomplish this special miracle. Either of these things could be happening here. Over the centuries, various known types of fish have been proposed as our great fish of 117. You might think, okay, well, what's that word? Let's take a look at that word in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word here for fish is a very general term. It's used in other places in the Old Testament to refer to all kinds of created sea life. Some point to Matthew 12 for some help. In that passage, Jesus refers to this miracle, Matthew chapter 12. And the Greek word that he uses, uh, that Matthew is using for Jesus' speech, the Greek word there for the fish uh, that Jesus speaks of can be translated huge fish, sea monster or whale over time some have proposed that our great fish here was a sperm whale a whale shark or a great white shark all three of those are known to be in the mediterranean sea where jonah was 
and there is even documented cases of these three over the centuries swallowing people whole. The Institute for Creation Research says that this great fish, their take is that it was probably some type of ancient sea monster or sea serpent. The organization Answers in Genesis points to two marine biologists in the United States who believe it was a great white shark. Listen, I know many of you, if you're like me, are interested in this part of the discussion. It's interesting to think through the options of what this great fish of 117 could have been. But I want to be very careful to say at this point that my trust, my trust in the accuracy of this account does not rest on the ability to prove it using modern evidence of marine life. That is to say, God is not bound by the scientific understanding that we bring into 117 today. There are people and scholars who look at this verse 17 and refuse to believe in the power of our God to accomplish this miracle. They try to wrap their minds around it solely on modern evidence and remove, listen, remove the power of God from the equation. And what I'm saying to you this morning is I can't do that. <laughs> our God is powerful, folks. The events of 117 are nothing to him, are easy for him to accomplish. Jonah, facing certain death, is preserved through this appointed great fish by our God. Of course, over time, this event has, be, uh, has become the most remembered event of the entire book. The events of verse 17, if you just think about it, have found their way into uh, popular culture. Think about just the movie. You have Pinocchio and Geppetto being swallowed by a whale. You have Dory and Marlin being swallowed by the whale and finding Nemo. I have this cool uh, book about the Star Wars movies at home. And it's a book about the mythology and the symbolism that have found its way into the Star Wars movies. And on one of those pages, seen here, I took a picture and have it up here for you. On one of the pages, they compare the scene where Han and Leia and Chewie and C-3PO are swallowed by this giant space slug thing. You remember that? Some of you remember that scene. They compare that scene, look at the picture that's underneath it, to Jonah and the account of 117. In other words, you'll see Jonah's experience in the fish being weaved into modern storytelling, if you watch for it. A character is swallowed by something or trapped in something, and the author uses that to show some sort of character development. Perhaps the character is dying to themselves in the beast and being kind of reborn and changed, you know, something like that. Which, by the way, might hint... Give us a hint that Jonah is going to show some change in this account. By the way, that's just some free film analysis with Steve there for you this morning. The point is, verse 17 is ingrained in our culture. It's the one verse that people focus on from this book, which is sort of a shame. Because there's so much more going on in this book. Chapters 3 and 4 almost become an afterthought. <laughs> People just kind of stop at 17. God ordains this great fish to swallow Jonah and preserve his life. Now, notice. We are told that Jonah was there for three days and three nights. Jonah was preserved alive in this fish by God for three full days. Someone has uh, rightly observed that it's not just a miracle here that God is supernaturally appointing and directing this fish to swallow Jonah. It's not just that. Don't overlook the fact that it is a miracle of God that Jonah is not digested in this fish. Three full days. 
his life is preserved, alive in this great fish appointed by God. So don't miss the big picture here, folks. It's possible to get caught up in the details of God's miracle, but don't miss what's going on in the course of the account of the full book. Jonah was commanded by God to go to Nineveh and preach. He disobeyed and fled. God sent a storm at sea, and everyone on the ship understood this is a supernatural storm sent by God in relation to Jonah's disobedience. The lots showed that, right? The casting of the lots. The only solution that Jonah and the sailors could see was to throw him into the open ocean in order to appease God. They do so. Everyone understands that this means his death. He hits the water. Death is certain. And yet, here in verse 17, God commands this great fish to swallow him and preserve his life for three days. By the way, why three days? You ever thought about that? Why three days? Now, there's some ties to the New Testament. I, some of you might be thinking that already, but why three days? Why did God have him in the fish for that long? We said last time that it sure seems like the ship was close to land during this storm. So why didn't God just have the fish swallow Jonah and take him right to the land? That could have happened probably in a matter of minutes. Why keep Jonah in there for three days? What's God's purpose or design for Jonah during this time? I think that God is appointing this time of solitude for Jonah in order to get his attention. I think this is an appointed, purposeful time of quiet and isolation for the Lord to do a deeper work in his servant, to allow for quieter moments of listening to God. Think about it. The storm, the boat, had been a frantic, chaotic scene. <laughs> but now, Jonah has three days of quiet by himself, swimming around in the ocean. He has this time to turn his heart to the Lord and to listen. By the way, I believe that God still appoints seasons like this for his servant today seasons where you may be more out of the spotlight perhaps not serving the lord in the ways that you normally do these seasons can look quite different from person to person in terms of what circumstances the lord uses but i believe he still appoints seasons of quiet to do a deep work in the life of his servant and if and when you find yourself there believer let me encourage you don't fight these quieter seasons R.T. Kendall, one author, said of Jonah's quiet season in the fish, he said this, the belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it's a great place to learn. <laughs> Don't fight those seasons, believer. Lean into the Lord in these times. Listen to him. Spend time with him in his word and in prayer. So we have our man Jonah, three full days in this great fish. Think about it. Just let your mind kind of go there. What was this like? Probably not all that comfortable. <laughs> Probably not a lot of room to stretch out. Probably smelly. Think about the motion of the animals, of the fish. Some of you who have been on a cruise and gotten seasick, think about this. Think about that he may have had no idea what had him. Did he see it as it was coming? I mean, think of that, if he actually saw it, or if he didn't see it. And yet the Lord has rescued him from certain death. He's now in a place of solitude and in a place where we suspect the Lord is getting his attention. And so, with all of that in our minds, we arrive at chapter 2. Let's read chapter 2 together. And then we will talk about this great prayer of Jonah. Take a look at chapter 2, verse 1, and I just want to read this song of Jonah. Look at 2, 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. 
For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the root of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Does the Lord now have Jonah's attention? <laughs> Verse 1. Then from the fish, Jonah prays to the Lord his God. This is a big deal after last week, if you remember, folks. Last week we had zero indication that Jonah took time to pray to God in the storm, even after the pagan captain of the boat asked him to. No indication that he ever prayed, but now finally he turns to the Lord in this chapter. And what we have in this chapter, folks, is what is known as a traditional Hebrew psalm of thanksgiving. It follows that pattern. Now, before we get into the details of this song, I want you to notice the timing of these events in this chapter. Write down the word timing. There are differing opinions on the timing of things, but I will share my thoughts with you. I believe what we are looking at in chapter 2 is a prayer, listen, a prayer or a song about a prayer previously spoken. Do you follow me? Let me tell you what I mean by that. Verse 1 tells us that Jonah is praying in the fish, right? And what we have then are the words to that prayer or song in 2 through 9. However, in this prayer or song, we have reference to another prayer. Look again at verse 2. Jonah says, I called, I cried. What tense is that? Past, right? Look at verse 7. I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you. Again, past tense. Here's what I think is going on. Jonah hits the water He's sinking in the ocean, and in that moment, somewhere in that sinking, he cries out to God in prayer. And now, looking back on that prayer and God's response, he offers this prayer or song recorded for us in chapter 2. Does that make sense? I hope so. That's what I think we're looking at, and we'll note that again as we investigate the text. Let's break the prayer down into four parts. We will start this way. First of all, part one of this song, an introduction to his distress, verse two. He says, I called, <coughs> excuse me, I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Again, I think Jonah is talking about a prayer that he prayed between hitting the water and being swallowed by the fish. Somewhere in that time, his mind turned to the Lord and he cried out, which is mentioned twice in verse 2. We said last week that it sure seemed that Jonah would rather die than face his assignment to go to Nineveh. It was his idea, after all, to have the sailors throw him overboard. And yet in those moments of sinking, can you imagine? In those moments of sinking, he realizes, this is not what I want. <laughs> and he cries out to God in distress. He references the belly of Sheol here. To the Hebrew, like Jonah at this time, Sheol was the place of the dead. It was also used as an expression for the grave. So please notice here, folks. Jonah is describing a very serious situation that he was in. This wasn't just some struggle, some pickle, some sticky situation. 
Jonah rightly recognized that when he hit the water and began to sink, he was dead. And we are told right away here at the beginning that he stares death right in the eyes and he cries out to the Lord. And notice, verse 2, the Lord answered him. He heard his voice. It's the first part of the song. Second part of the song is this. Jonah goes into more detail about the distress he has been in. We see this in verses 3 through 6, the first part of verse 6, and what imagery he uses here. Look again at verse 3. You cast me. Who did it? You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Notice the Lord's flood that surrounds Jonah, his waves, his billows. When Jonah is tossed overboard, he is in the middle of the vast ocean. Can you imagine? How many of you have been out on the open ocean? Let me see your hand. Out on the open sea, ocean. Not just a pond or a lake, I mean the ocean. Okay. Good number of us have. I'm not talking about a beach in Florida or California somewhere. I'm talking about out in the boat on the open sea, many of you done that a couple times in my life most recently when we went to california a couple years ago and and we went on kind of a whale watching trip off the coast of la and if you've been out on the ocean and if you're like me and maybe you're not but if you are your reaction to being on the ocean is a fascinating mix of both wonder and fear <laughs> it's a wonder it's glorious it's beautiful and yet at the same time, it holds mystery and awe and fear. It makes you feel small when you realize there's a whole other world out here that you and I are not a part of. Now imagine, just try to imagine, Jonah is thrown overboard into the open ocean. It's a terrifying thought. And he says in his distress, look at the verse again, verse 3, your flood surrounded me. He's sinking, sinking, sinking down into the blackness of the ocean. Look at verse 4. He says that he's been driven away from God's sight in these moments, meaning he's headed to his death. And yet notice, while that is happening, at some point, he says, verse 4, I will again look upon your holy temple. I believe a reference to the fact that in his mind, while he, while he was sinking, he begins to turn to God in prayer. Verse 4 is our first sign of hope in Jonah. Verse 5, look at the language here. The water's closed in over me to take my life. He's drowning and he knows it. Verse 5, weeds were wrapped around my head. Did he reach the bottom? Did seaweed literally wrap around him? We don't know, of course, for sure, but don't miss the point of the poetry. Jonah is trapped. He's going to die. There is no escape. The waters have surrounded him. The weeds are wrapping around him and trapping him, sinking deeper and deeper. He's losing his breath. Verse 6, look at it. He's at the roots of the mountain describing himself in a land where bars are closed upon me forever. He's trapped. Get the picture. He's as deep as you can imagine, roots of the mountains, trapped, seaweed around him, no escape, bars enclosing him. Folks, all of this is painting the picture. Jonah is dead. There's no hope. <laughs> and yet, Second half of verse 6 and verse 7 is the turning point in this song. It's the third part of our song. We'll call it the Lord's Rescue. Look at verse 7 first. Write down rescue and then look at verse 7. As this was happening, Jonah's at death's door. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, he's like on his last breath, or last ability to hold that breath. When that was happening, I remembered the Lord. 
and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. And then the last part of verse 6, I love this. You brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. What's going on here? What's he reflecting back on in the last part of verse 6? The fish, <laughs> right? The fish. The fish has snatched him up, perhaps taking a mouthful of seaweed with him as well. And the Lord has rescued Jonah from certain death. Now, don't miss the final part of the song, part four. We will call it Jonah's response of thanksgiving. Verses eight and nine. In verse eight, he comments on the futility of worshiping idols. Isn't that an interesting turn in his prayer? The futility of worshiping idols. He says, basically, those who worship false gods forfeit their opportunity for rescue like I just had. They forsake their hope of steadfast love from God, mercy, compassion from God. You wonder if he had the sailors in mind as he prayed this, not knowing perhaps how they now feared the one true God. We talked about that last week. You wonder if Jonah had his own people in mind here. You remember that Israel at this time, the northern kingdom, was a wreck spiritually. But then look at verse 9, the final statement in this song. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah says, look, this rescue from death that the Lord has mercifully granted me, I'm not just going to sit on this. I'm going to offer my sacrifice of praise to God. I'm going to fulfill my vow. What do you think he means by that? Many believe he's referencing his vow to serve as a prophet of the Lord. Notice, folks, the rescue of God results in actions of thankfulness from Jonah. So, there's the song of Jonah from the belly of this great fish. It's a prayer or song that he sang reflecting back on a prayer that he cried out while sinking and reflecting back on how God answered that prayer, the rescue of the fish. To close here in a minute, we're going to dive into a few observations from this song. But before we do that, don't miss the fact that we have a verse 10 in chapter 2. Let's read that together, and we'll see the great release. Look at verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish. Song is done, end of prayer, and then we have this. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And we'll end there for this morning. Don't you love this language here? The Lord spoke to the fish. Isn't that great? Release him, fish. <laughs> and it does. I imagine that the fish was quite relieved itself to be able to get Jonah out. This is an undigested thing in me for three days. And Jonah finds himself back on land. Where was he? We're not told. Most speculate that it was back near Joppa, where he had left from some point to other places. But most think he is back in the Joppa area in his home country of the northern kingdom of Israel. He is alive and well. His heart seems to be in a much better place. And we will, Lord willing, pick up the account next week to see where it goes from here. However, to close our time this morning, let's take a look at three closing observations from his song. I want to touch on three key ideas in this chapter and what it can mean for our lives today. Here's the first. Write this down. The rescue of God. The rescue of God. At its core, folks, at its core, the second chapter of Jonah is a rescue account. It is the account, listen, of God bringing Jonah back from the absolute brink of death. Jonah was as good as dead, and God told the fish, get him, <laughs> and then release him. And the Lord preserved his life and took him to dry land. Folks, please keep this thought in mind. 
Jonah deserved to die. He deserved to die. Don't forget the utter rebellion and disobedience and ugliness of Jonah in chapter 1. Don't forget that. He rebelled against God. He disobeyed God's direct command, and he deserved nothing but death at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. But God, in mercy, snatched him up and rescued him. And it's not long before we're reminded of ourselves in that, is it? God's word is clear that every single one of us is born dead in our sin before God. Dead. Each one of us has wandered away from God in our sin, disobeyed, rejected God, turned to our own way. And because of that, we have earned, deserved death and eternal separation from God, Romans chapter 6. All of us are dead in our sin. Ephesians 2 says that apart from Christ, we are, quote, dead in our sin, objects of God's holy wrath against sin, and enemies of God. That's who we are apart from Christ. We are at the bottom of the open ocean, as it were, seaweed around our necks. We are dead. And yet, <laughs> and yet, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we are snatched from death, just like Jonah was. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can be rescued from sin and death. In fact, don't forget that Jesus himself used Jonah's three days in the fish as a comparison to what? His three days in the tomb, in the grave, and resurrection. Just like Jonah, so Jesus, dead and buried for three days, came to life again. And because he bore the wrath of God against your sin on the cross, and because he rose to life again, you and I can be forgiven of our sin before God and have eternal life with him even though we die. To have that applied to our lives, the scripture, God himself, his word, calls us to recognize our sin before him and to trust in Jesus Christ alone for our forgiveness. Jonah chapter 2 is a rescue from death song. And likewise, we have been given the opportunity through faith in Christ to be rescued from our sin. Have you recognized your sin before God and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not asking if you attend church. I'm not asking if you want some kind of moral center for your children. I'm not asking if you do good things, if you shoveled your neighbor's drive this winter. I'm asking you if you understand the utter state of death that you are in without Jesus. And I'm asking if you have bowed your heart to the Lord in faith, which always shows itself in action in your life. Speaking of action, we come to our second observation, and that is this, the response of Jonah. This is a funny one, the response of Jonah. The response of Jonah, these are building on each other, the response of Jonah to God's rescue, which we just talked about, is something we need to see this morning. First of all, we see Jonah is in a very different place than chapter 1. Would you agree? He's changed. In fact, one author I read this week noted that this is really the high mark of the book for Jonah. <laughs> it's his happiest moment in the book, his best moment right here, which tells us something about where this is going right? in chapters 3 and 4. But here he's looking to God. He seems to recognize his disobedience and cry out to God for mercy. He's thankful for God's rescue. He composes this great song of thanksgiving from within the fish. Jonah's response is that of gratitude. But I want you to notice again the last two verses of the song, 8 and 9. His gratitude is seen in action. One author said, Jonah just didn't bask in the Lord's rescue, just sitting back in that fish and just, wow, you know, this is awesome. 
He didn't just bask in the Lord's rescue. He responded with action. With action. Look at verse 9 again. You say, what's his action? He says, I will vocally praise God for this rescue. I will praise God with my voice. Secondly, I will fulfill the vow that he made, that I made to God. Most likely his prophetic ministry. Jonah will live out his thankfulness, listen, with praise and obedience. Praise and obedience. Now, there's several different directions we could take that in terms of practical application to our lives. But this week I found myself thinking most about the aspect of our praise. How we vocalize our gratitude towards God. I'm talking to born-again believers in Jesus Christ right now, those who have been snatched from death to life through Christ. And I'm talking about how we praise God with our lips, just like Jonah does in the belly of the fish. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to remind us and encourage us to cover Jonah's song of praise, to cover it. Do you know what it means when someone covers a song? When a musical artist or band puts out a song that someone else has already done. <laughs> Can you think of any? I looked up some famous examples. Some of the most famous examples include the song, I Will Always Love You by Dolly Parton, but then it hit another stratosphere when Whitney Houston sang it years ago. Or the song, Mr. Tambourine Man, which the band The Birds put out, but not before Bob Dylan, very good, did it first. Or one of my favorites. I had to pick one back from my day. The song, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You, originally sung by Elvis, but then covered by the great band UB40. Here's why I'm talking about this. When is it, brothers and sisters, that you cover Jonah's song? That you cover Jonah's song? When is it that you, like Jonah, express your praise to God for the rescue that he has given you in Christ? When do you do that? When are you taking time to express thankfulness and praise to God for snatching you from death and hell and giving you new life in Christ? I want to particularly challenge my brothers in Christ this morning, you men. I've heard countless times over the years from many different men. So I'm not picking on anybody here. Please understand that. I've heard this many times in many different churches, many different men, statements like, I'm not a singer. <laughs> or jokes that kind of put down your voice. I've done that. Jokes that put down your voice as the reason why you don't sing, perhaps very loudly on Sunday morning. Can I just lovingly ask you men, if that's you, as I ask myself, my question is, if you're not doing it here, then when are you doing it? Are you taking time to express thanksgiving and praise to God for rescuing you from death? And you might say, well, I can do that without singing. And you can. You can. But I'd like to do away with this notion that, that singing is unmasculine in some way. Let's remind ourselves that David wrestled a lion <laughs> and was the king of Israel. It's a pretty masculine thing. But he also danced before the Lord in 2 Samuel 6. And he was the most prolific writer of songs of thanksgiving like this one in the book of Jonah. Brothers, you men, if we're not praising God for rescue from death here, then is it happening? I just loving, lovingly as a brother ask you that question as I need to ask myself. Jonah's song of thanksgiving is a song, listen, that all of us in Christ should cover. Male and female. All of us should cover Jonah's song of thanksgiving. His song should be our song as we express gratitude in action through the praise of our lips and, of course, obedience, which he referenced to in verse 9. Finally, here's our third observation. Write this down. The return of our theme. 
pattern of our themes. The rescue of God, the response of Jonah, the return of our themes. I want to just mention two great themes of our book as we close. And I simply want to point out they show themselves in chapter 2, what we just read. First of all, we have the theme of God's great power. Last week, God brought the storm. He calmed the storm. He made the lots fall on Jonah. This week, how do we see the power of God in chapter 2? It's pretty easy to see, isn't it? He appoints the fish to rescue Jonah, and he commands the fish to release him. Not to mention <clears throat> that he preserves Jonah's life in the fish for three full days. Listen, our theme is here again. Our God is great in his power, awesome in his power. But secondly, we once again see the theme that our God is also great in his compassion. His compassion. Last week, who were the recipients of his compassion? The sailors, remember? And we also noted that God commanded Jonah to go show the Ninevites my compassion, though he did not obey. This week, who is the recipient of God's compassion? Jonah himself, isn't he? God compassionately, mercifully rescued Jonah from certain death. Now, Jonah certainly recognizes God's compassion in his own life. <laughs> However, we still have Nineveh hanging out there, don't we? Where is this account going to go? Jonah's back on dry land. Will the Lord again command him to go to Nineveh and preach to them to turn from their sin and to the Lord? If he does, if God does reissue that command, we would expect that Jonah, having been shown this amazing act of compassion in his life, <clears throat> and having made a vow possibly to fulfill his prophetic ministry, would now be willing to go to Nineveh and share God's compassion with them, right? After all this compassion God showed to him. Douglas Stewart says this, and I end with this. It is becoming clear that Jonah is being taught a lesson about grace. If Jonah himself experienced deliverance from such a deserved death, maybe then he will have the ability to commiserate with the citizens of Nineveh to whom he has been called to preach. Will not good now come? Will not the story end happily? With an obedient prophet, grateful to God for sparing his own life, preaching faithfully to Nineveh as it should have been all along? The story so far allows for just such an ending. Jonah had every reason to empathize with Nineveh now. <laughs> what do you think, folks? Are we in for a happy ending with our man Jonah? Surely the great compassion of our God in his life will lead him to go and, listen, joyfully, joyfully share the compassion of God to the people of the Assyrian Empire. Right? Nineveh deserved death and judgment. We talked about their evil last week. We maybe will again next week. Listen, Nineveh deserved death and judgment but then again, so did Jonah, right? And so do we. But God is great in his compassion. As Jonah himself said, don't miss this. What an ending to the song. Jonah said in verse 9, salvation belongs to our God. It's his area to decide on who he shows his compassion and salvation to is his prerogative. Surely Jonah has recognized this in light of himself, but also in light of Nineveh, right? 
join us next week, Lord willing, and we will begin to see how this all pans out. Father, we thank you for chapter 2. It's a turn in kind of the look of it. It's narrative in chapter 1. You turn to poetry here, and the rest of the book is narrative, so it's a change. But what a great inclusion this is to not only have the, the details of the rescue, the fish, the, the back on dry land, but, but to hear the heart of Jonah, to reflect upon how he cried out to you as he sank, how you rescued him, how he, I mean, just, just so often in that poem, in that song, in that prayer, he speaks of just, I, I was dead. snatched his life from, from the grips of death and life mercifully, compassionately we will see if you allow us to over the next few weeks um, how he handles his um, your expression of mercy to him in light of his call to your compassion to Nineveh but Lord even, even if we stop here and as we stop here we we look back on chapter 2 and we see the truth of our rescue from sin and death in Christ that you have provided and our call to cover the song of Jonah to likewise go forward with praise and obedience Lord whether we're talking about singing on Sunday morning or obedience to you during the week or, or personal times of worship during the week. I pray that we would live with a heart of praise that is quick to express to you the thanksgiving we have for snatching our life from sin and death and eternal separation in hell. And of course, we can say that those that can say that are those who have found in Christ eternal life through your death and resurrection and through repentance and faith. We give you our praise, including as we stand and sing this song now. We thank you for our Savior Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let's close with a song together.
Lord, we thank you for the satisfied wrath of God against sin, against our sin, through Jesus Christ. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. And by that, Lord, we praise you for the rescue you provided for us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Lord, we thank you for our missionaries in this month where we're dedicating a focus to global missions. I just pray for all of them that we support, that you would encourage them this morning as they worship with their brothers and sisters in these various countries and continents where they are. Um, encourage them, build them up, comfort them where they need comfort. Give them endurance and sustain them in their ministry activities. Uh, empower them. Uh, allow them to be effective, Lord, for, for your namesake. Uh, where there is opposition, we would pray for relief but we would also pray that you would have your way in their heart, in the opposition, and teach them what you want to teach them in that. And we pray for the opponents themselves, for their salvation. Thank you for the privilege we have of partnering with them. We ask that we would glorify you as we go from this place, Lord. In Jesus' name.